The man known to history as John J. Pershing was born on the 13th of September, 1860, on his parents' farm near the small town of Lockleed in Missouri. Pershing's father, John Fletcher Pershing, was born in 1834 and left his native Pennsylvania in the middle of the 19th century to seek his fortune along the Cumberland and Mississippi rivers, where he worked for several years piloting rafts of lumber down the river to the port at New Orleans. Pershing's mother was Anne Elizabeth Thompson from Tennessee. She hailed from a family of Virginians who moved west following the American Revolution. They married in 1859 while John was working as a foreman on the railroads. Soon after her marriage to John Fletcher Pershing, the pregnant Anne moved to Lynn County in northwest Missouri, where she gave birth to her first child, John Joseph Pershing. The couple would go on to have eight more children, though only five would survive infancy. The Pershing family had its origins in the Alsace region, now part of France, but for centuries, this area had been a bone of contention between France and the German states. Pershing's great-grandfather, Frederick Pershing, was born under French rule and immigrated to America in 1749, settling in Pennsylvania and marrying a German wife. Over time, the family changed the spelling of the name to Pershing without the F. The child was born two months before the presidential election on the 6th of November, 1860. After the Republican candidate, Abraham Lincoln, was elected president, the slaveholding states in the South feared that Lincoln would abolish slavery, and 11 of them would secede from the Union over the course of seven months to form the Confederate States of America. The American Civil War would rage for the next four years as Lincoln sought to defeat the Confederacy. Although split between pro-Unionists in the North and pro-Confederates in the South, Pershing's home state of Missouri remained loyal to the Union, and John Fletcher Pershing traveled with the Union Army as a merchant, supplying the 18th Missouri Volunteer Infantry Regiment. Some of John Joseph Pershing's earliest memories as a child would have included news in July 1863 of General George Meade's victory over General Robert E. Lee at Gettysburg in Pennsylvania and General Ulysses S. Grant's capture of Vicksburg on the Mississippi. These two battles collectively handed Union armies the initiative to conquer the South, but not before Pershing's hometown was raided by a band of pro-Southern guerrillas led by Captain Clifton Holtzclaw in June 1864. By September 1864, General William T. Sherman had captured the city of Atlanta, Georgia, in the heart of the Confederacy, and in April 1865, General Lee surrendered to General Grant at Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia, effectively ending the war. While a young John Pershing was growing up in the post-war years, his father John Fletcher ran a general store and served as postmaster of Lockleed placing the Pershings among the most respectable families in the town. The boy went to the local district school and was consistently top of his class, and his parents hoped to send him to college to study for a career in law. John Fletcher had always been an enterprising man, and when land prices skyrocketed at the end of the 1860s and early 1870s, he joined in the frenzy of speculation. When the land bubble popped in 1873, the Pershing finances were ruined, and 14-year-old John Pershing's hopes of going to college along with them. The teenager would have to help out on the farm and the store in order to support his large family. At the age of 18, Pershing spent a year teaching African-American children at Prairie Mound School. He saved up his teaching salary to study at the Kirksville Normal School for two years, where he graduated with a degree allowing him to teach anywhere in the state. He then returned to Prairie Mound and continued to work on the family farm. The 21-year-old Pershing continued to have hopes of a legal career, but that changed upon hearing about a vacancy from his congressional district for a cadetship at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. Although not particularly interested in a military career, Pershing took the chance to receive a free education of a much higher standard than his native Missouri. 
scoring the highest among a group of 17 in the local examinations. Within days, Pershing left for West Point to prepare for the national examinations. Attending a prep school at nearby Highland Falls, set up by Colonel Caleb Hughes, a former Confederate officer. After successfully becoming one of the 129 cadets admitted in the autumn of 1882, Pershing was elected class president during all four years at the academy. In between disciplines such as drilling, riding, and fencing, Pershing and his fellow cadets were often inspected by distinguished Union commanders who were graduates of the academy, including General Sherman, General Winfield Scott Hancock, and Grant himself, who was in his final years after serving two terms as president. When Grant's funeral train passed in West Point on its way to New York City in July 1885, senior cadet Captain Pershing led the salute. Pershing graduated from West Point in the summer of 1886, ranking 30th out of 77 in his class, and was commissioned a second lieutenant. By the time of his graduation, the Civil War was more than 20 years in the past, and there seemed little prospect of the United States being involved in any wars. Having been significantly reduced after the Civil War, what remained of the regular army was primarily stationed in the West, where occasionally they would see action against the Indian tribes, which had not submitted to the United States, though the Apache chief Geronimo would surrender in early September 1886. On the 30th of September, Pershing was assigned to Troop L of the 6th U.S. Cavalry Regiment, stationed at Fort Bayard, New Mexico. He saw occasional action rounding up small groups of Apache, who held out despite their chief's surrender, and his success in doing so caught the attention of General Nelson A. Miles. In late 1890, the 6th Cavalry was sent north to South Dakota to take part in the final campaign against the Sioux Indians. With little left to do in terms of active service, in September 1891, the 31-year-old Pershing was appointed Professor of Military Science and Tactics and Commandant of the Cadet Corps at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. Pershing would additionally serve as a mathematics instructor, and the university allowed him to take the law course as a student. During his four years at the university, Pershing trained the Cadet Corps at Nebraska so well that U.S. inspectors considered it the second best in the country, after West Point, further increasing Pershing's stature among War Department officials. Even so, promotion prospects were bleak in peacetime, and after receiving his law degree in 1893, Pershing was admitted to the bar in Nebraska. However, another economic depression that year prompted him to remain in uniform. After unsuccessfully applying for the captaincy in the quartermaster's department, in 1895 Pershing was promoted to first lieutenant and commanded a troop in the 10th Cavalry, a regiment of African-American troopers, at Fort Assiniboine in Montana. He led his troopers on a mission to round up 600 Cree Native Americans and return them to Canada. In early 1897, Pershing was appointed acting aide to General Miles, who was then serving as commanding general of the United States Army. When Miles sent him to New York to report on a military tournament, he sat in a box with New York Police Commissioner Theodore Roosevelt, and the two shared their experiences of the West. The paths of the two men would cross again soon, but in autumn 1897, Pershing returned to West Point as an instructor in tactics. Such a position was not to Pershing's liking, especially as the United States was preparing for military intervention in Cuba in response to the heavy-handed approach of the Spanish authorities in suppressing revolts to its colonial rule. The sinking of the USS Maine in Havana Harbor in February 1898 led President William McKinley to declare war. The first volunteer cavalry regiment was being formed under the auspices of Colonel Leonard Wood and his deputy Theodore Roosevelt. After making an appeal to the Secretary of War, Pershing was ordered to rejoin the 10th Cavalry as its regimental quartermaster, and his association with the African-American troopers earned him the nickname, Blackjack. The 10th Cavalry was part of the 5th Army Corps, being assembled in Tampa under the overall command of General William Shafter. 
After sailing to Cuba in June, Pershing fought alongside Roosevelt and his Rough Riders at Kettle Hill and San Juan Hill on the 1st of July, 1898, where he was awarded the Silver Star for gallantry. Pershing's men would go on to besiege the port of Santiago de Cuba, whose surrender after two weeks encouraged the Spanish government to seek peace terms. Although the United States had defeated Spain in less than four months, the logistical and organizational problems in the army caused a national scandal and prompted the resignation of Secretary of War Russell Alger, who was succeeded by New York lawyer Elihu Root. Following the war with Spain, the United States had also taken possession of the former Spanish colonies of Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines. In addition to Cuba, Pershing was assigned to the Ordnance Department with the temporary rank of Major, establishing the Office of Customs and Insular Affairs to oversee the occupation of these newly acquired territories. After the outbreak of war between the Philippines and the United States in 1899, Pershing was dispatched as an adjutant in the islands of Mindanao and Holo, home to large numbers of Muslim Moros who fiercely resisted American rule. After his promotion to captain in February 1901, Pershing took charge of efforts to pacify the Moros around Lake Lano by convincing the chieftains or Datus that he and his men could be deadly in battle but fair in maintaining the peace and he was recognized by them as the American Datu. His successes in establishing order caught the attention of Secretary of War Root, Governor William Howard Taft, and Theodore Roosevelt, now President of the United States. Secretary Root's reorganization of the War Department included the establishment of a general staff system, and Pershing was recalled to Washington in June 1903. In a message to Congress, President Roosevelt sought to introduce a system of promotion by merit rather than seniority and singled out Captain Pershing as worthy of promotion to colonel in recognition for his success in the Philippines. Congress did not adopt the president's recommendations and in 1904, Pershing was assigned to staff duty at the Southwestern Department at Oklahoma City and later a student officer at the Army War College. During this period, the attention of military staffs around the world were drawn to Manchuria, where the Russian and Japanese empires fought over control of Northeast China and the Korean Peninsula. American public opinion sided with the Japanese underdog, which surprised observers by defeating the Russian army at Liaoyong in southern Manchuria and capturing the vital naval base of Port Arthur at the beginning of 1905. The armies in land battles of the Russo-Japanese War were by far the largest in history, and foreign observers were keen to learn about the application of modern weapons and tactics. In January 1905, Pershing was appointed military attaché to Japan and sailed there with his new wife Helen, the daughter of Republican Senator Francis Warren of Wyoming, who would give her husband four children over the course of their marriage. Pershing was attached to the 1st Japanese Army under the command of General Kuroki Temimoto. The attaches were allowed to observe general movements from troops, from vantage points, and received lectures from Japanese staff officers about the progress of the battle, but they were not permitted to accompany the soldiers as they attacked. Pershing had arrived at the front in March during the final stages of the Battle of Mukden, which saw the Japanese take control of southern Manchuria. In the meantime, the Japanese Navy defeated the Russian 2nd Pacific Fleet at the Straits of Tsushima at the end of May. Despite these successes, the Japanese military supplies and its government finances were running low, while large Russian armies remained on the field. Following mediation by President Roosevelt, the Treaty of Portsmouth was signed in September 1905, ending the war. During these six months, Despite the unsanitary conditions and unfamiliar climate, Pershing learned as much from the Japanese about modern warfare as he could. Following his service in Japan, Pershing was recommended for promotion to Brigadier General by President Roosevelt. As his father-in-law, Senator Warren, served as chair of the Senate Military Affairs Committee, the nomination was easily approved. After receiving the promotion, he was sent back to the Philippines as the commander of the garrison of Fort McKinley. After two years, 
he was sent to Paris on a mission to report on the condition of the European armies. After his return to the United States, he returned to the general staff but was granted a six-month leave of absence to restore his health, which had been affected by his service in the Philippines. By December 1909, he was back to full health and returned to the Philippines as the military governor of Moro province, remaining faithful to his approach a decade earlier by governing the province with a combination of force and diplomacy. In order to deter suicide attacks by Moro insurgents, American troops adopted the practice of burying a dead pig with the bodies of Muslim attackers, though there is no evidence that Pershing personally gave these orders. In 1911, Pershing sought to disarm the Moros to maintain order and obtain the agreement of most Datus, though a minority resisted. In June 1913, Pershing defeated 800 Moros under Datu Amil at the Battle of Budbaksak, which effectively put an end to Moro resistance. After providing for the transition from military to civil authority in Moro province, Pershing returned to the United States and in December 1913, he took command of the 8th Brigade, posted at the Presidio in San Francisco. In late April 1914, the brigade was sent to Fort Bliss in Texas in response to political tensions in Mexico. In February 1913, General Victoriano Huerta seized power in a coup. President Woodrow Wilson of the United States refused to recognize Huerta's government, and in April 1914, American soldiers occupied the port of Veracruz. Although protested by both Huerta and his domestic opponents, the American occupation was a factor in Huerta's decision to go into exile. After the constitutionalist Venustiano Carranza took power in his place, his former ally General Pancho Villa turned on the new government. Pershing had not expected to be in Texas for long and decided to leave his family behind in San Francisco, but the Mexican crisis was such that he was away from home for more than a year. While making arrangements to bring his family to Texas, Pershing received news that his wife and three daughters had died in a house fire, with his six-year-old son Warren being the only survivor of the tragedy. The boy accompanied Pershing's sister Mary to Texas, while the devastated general continued to work hard, motivated by his devotion to duty and the desire to blunt the pain of his loss. Pershing's duty would soon come calling, when on the 9th of March 1916, Pancho Villa crossed the border into the town of Columbus in New Mexico, killing 18 American soldiers and civilians in the process. Villa had been defeated on several occasions by Carranza's government forces and hoped to draw the United States into a war with Mexico. Newly appointed Secretary of War Newton D. Baker appointed Pershing to command an expedition to pursue and capture Villa. In spite of these instructions, the Wilson administration was keen to avoid outright war with Mexico, and the capture and execution of Villa by the United States could further inflame tensions between the two countries. Leading a force which would grow to 10,000 men, Pershing pursued Villa deep into the Mexican territory, but further incursions were resisted by Carranza's government. For the next 11 months, Pershing's men would be 200 miles within Mexican territory, seeking to avoid war but ready to defend itself against any army that confronted it. After the dispute was referred to a joint commission, Pershing's men were withdrawn in February 1917. By the time Pershing returned from Mexico, the First World War was well into its third year. The war had broken out in August 1914, as the Allied powers of Britain, France, and Russia clashed with the central powers of Austria-Hungary and Germany on several fronts. On the Eastern Front, the Germans won significant victories at Tannenberg and the Masurian Lakes in late August and early September, forcing the Russian army to abandon Poland in 1915. On the Western Front, the Germans invaded France and gained considerable territory, but failed in the attempt to encircle Paris. The German and the Anglo-French armies raced to the North Sea in an effort to outflank the other, but by the end of 1914, the Western Front was effectively stalemated. Despite a sustained German offensive at Verdun throughout most of 1916 and an Anglo-French offensive at the Somme in the second half of the year, 
the front remained largely unchanged. The Eastern Front was a more dynamic affair, and in the summer of 1916, a Russian offensive led by General Alexei Brusilov in Galicia and western Ukraine inflicted considerable damage on the Austro-Hungarian army, which had to be rescued by German troops. However, the Russians were unable to capitalize on the offensive, and heavy combat losses destabilized the home front, contributing to the overthrow of Tsar Nicholas II's autocratic government in the February Revolution of 1917. Although President Wilson proclaimed neutrality and was keen to stay out of the war, the United States was not a passive observer in the conflict. The British maritime blockade of Germany disrupted American trade, but orders for munitions from the Allies led to a boom in the American economy. German submarines attacked Allied merchant ships carrying food and munitions across the Atlantic. And although the Germans tended to avoid attacking American ships, American lives were occasionally lost on board British ships sunk by German torpedoes. The sinking of the passenger liner Lusitania in May 1915, with the loss of almost 1,200 lives, including 128 Americans, caused outrage among the American public. While President Wilson continued to resist calls to go to war, he authorized increased spending in the Army and Navy to prepare for potential hostilities against Germany. The following May, after a torpedo attack on the steamship Sussex, the President scored a major diplomatic victory by forcing the Germans to agree not to target passenger ships nor to attack merchant vessels without warning. However, at the end of January 1917, Germany announced the renewal of unrestricted submarine warfare on the 1st of February. Less than a month later, Wilson was informed by the British of a telegram sent in January by German Foreign Minister Arthur Zimmerman proposing an alliance with Mexico, encouraging the Mexicans to reconquer Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas from the United States. By the time the President declared war on Germany on the 6th of April 1917, Pershing had succeeded the late Frederick Funston as commander of the Southern Department of San Antonio with the rank of Major General. On the 7th of May, Pershing was ordered to go to Washington and report to the Secretary of War. Responding to British and French requests for American troops, Wilson hoped to send a division to France, although Theodore Roosevelt proposed taking a volunteer force of four cavalry divisions to France. Wilson rejected him due to lack of military experience, and Senior Major General Leonard Wood was overlooked due to his friendship with Roosevelt and his criticism of the Wilson administration. Almost by default, Major General John J. Pershing was named commander of the American Expeditionary Force, or AEF. Although the Army did not have enough men to spare for a division, Wilson decided to send Pershing ahead with his staff and officers, while the men were trained in cantonments stateside before being shipped out to France. From an office in the War Department, Pershing set about recruiting the men who would accompany him to France. As his chief of staff, he appointed Major James G. Harbord, despite his close association with Wood, and the two worked together to assemble the small team of officers who would join them in France. The orders Pershing received from President Wilson gave him command of American forces in all Europe and stipulated that the identity of the American army should be preserved. In other words, not to allow American units to be dispersed under French or British command. On the 28th of May, 1917, Pershing and his small group of fewer than 200 men sailed for France on the ocean liner RMS Baltic, escorted by two American destroyers. While on board, Pershing informed his future biographer Frederick Palmer, who was then attached to the AEF as a war correspondent, that he expected he would need an army of one million men in France. Pershing and his officers were greeted enthusiastically as they arrived in Liverpool and made their way to France via London. At Napoleon's tomb at the Church of Les Invalides in Paris, Pershing was presented with Napoleon's sword and raised it to his lips in a symbolic gesture. In the weeks before Pershing's arrival in France, a major Allied offensive planned by Commander-in-Chief Robert Nivelle was beaten back by German defenses on the Hindenburg Line. 
After thousands of French officers rose up in mutiny, Neville was sacked and replaced by General Philippe Pétain, the Lion of Verdun, who skillfully dealt with the mutiny by executing its ringleaders, while allowing most of the men leave to recuperate back at home. With the French army in no condition to launch an offensive, Pershing surveyed the other fronts and found little cause for optimism. A Russian offensive in June had collapsed within a month, and the Communist Bolshevik Party seemed destined to seize power at any moment, while the Italians struggled to hold their positions against the Austrians in the Alpine passes. The deadlock could only be broken by a large American army which did not yet exist. Its commander was confident that America's vast economic resources and manpower would make the difference, but warned his allies that it would take time. Pershing ensured that French war propagandists would not promise too much on behalf of the American war effort in order to retain his credibility. While the generals on the Western Front commanded hundreds of thousands of men, the largest contingent Pershing had ever commanded was the 10,000-strong force of the Pancho Villa expedition. The United States' experience of warfare on such a scale was purely theoretical, and even after the men of the American Expeditionary Force arrived in France in large numbers, they would still require further training. Pershing was confident enough that he could train his men behind the Anglo-French trench wall on the Western Front. He envisaged that he would train his army in French Lorraine, and once he had a sufficient army under him, he could target the salient at saint me -Il, the fortress of Metz behind it, as well as the iron fields and railroad system that served as the line of supply communications for the German army in Belgium and Western France. After the first American contingent arrived at the end of June 1917, Pershing and his officers began to implement their training plan, drilling the men behind the lines before gradually introducing them to trench warfare. When the French suggested that the fresh American troops should be paraded through Paris on the 4th of July, Pershing agreed to send a battalion of the 16th Infantry Regiment. Starting from the Invalides, the parade arrived at the grave of the Marquis of Lafayette in the Picpus Cemetery, where Staff Officer Captain Charles Stanton made a speech on Pershing's behalf and announced, Lafayette, we are here. After the festivities, Pershing's thoughts returned to how his army could help the Allies win the war, and in July he sent two messages to Secretary Baker requesting an army of at least a million men by May 1918, adding that he may require up to three million men in total. Even if the men could be recruited and equipped, they would have to be transported across the Atlantic, and Pershing emphasized the need for transport ships. With French industry at breaking point supplying the French and British armies, Pershing would need his own trucks and railroad locomotives, as well as hospitals, storehouses, and all other amenities required to sustain an independent American army. As if to emphasize the size of the military establishment he would take charge of, at the end of September, Pershing moved from his modest headquarters in a house on the banks of the Seine to an old French barrack at Chaumont in Lorraine. Pershing's aides included Colonel James Collins, who enjoyed a close relationship with the general dating from their service in Mexico, while Colonel Carl Boyd, a fluent French speaker, was crucial as an interpreter during meetings with French generals and politicians. In October 1917, Pershing was promoted to the rank of four-star general. He ensured that his men were well-disciplined, and his notorious attention to detail made his men as fearful of their commander's inspections as they were of the enemy. The stern discipline made for an efficient army, and when drilling his men, Pershing laid particular emphasis on the accuracy of rifle fire. Despite impatient calls by French generals and politicians for the Americans to take their positions in the trenches, Pershing preferred to wait, knowing that his men were not yet ready and their mediocre performance in the heat of battle could dent Allied morale. Though by October, American units had begun to man quiet sections of the line in Lorraine, while both the French and the British hoped that American units would serve under their command, Pershing insisted on retaining independent command of his men to preserve their identity as instructed by the President. Pershing's stubbornness created tensions among the Allied generals who anticipated a major German offensive in the spring. 
In November 1917, Bolshevik leader Vladimir Lenin overthrew the liberal provisional government of Alexander Kerensky in Russia with the promise of peace. In December 1917, peace negotiations between Russia and Germany were opened at brest litovsk This gave the German army the opportunity to redeploy 50 divisions to the Western Front in an attempt to break the Anglo-French defenses before the Americans could arrive in force. The small trickle of American troops that had arrived in France were not adequately supplied, but while Pershing wrote to the Secretary of War, requesting provisions, he forbade his subordinates from sharing similar messages to politicians at home, fearing that it might undermine the home front. By the end of 1917, the United States already had a million men ready to go to France, along with large stocks of ammunition and supplies for the Allies. The only constraint was a shortage of ships to transport them across the Atlantic. In January 1918, as the British and French desperately requested American reinforcements, the British agreed to transport six American divisions to France to train with the British Army. By the time Secretary Baker visited France in March to inspect Pershing's troops, the AEF had four divisions of combat-ready troops, around 100,000 men in total. On the 21st of March, General Erich von Ludendorff launched the German Spring Offensive, with the first attack targeting the area around St. Quentin at the junction of the French and British sectors. Within three days, General Hubert Goff's 5th Army was in full retreat, but Patan was slow coming to the aid of his British allies. The German breakthrough threatened to open a fatal breach in Allied lines, forcing the British to retreat their lines of communications on the North Sea, while the French would be obliged to defend Paris. On the 26th of March, General Ferdinand Foch was appointed to coordinate the Allied response to the Spring Offensive. The following day, Pershing arrived at Foch's headquarters and promised the French commander, All we have are yours. And a week later, Pershing spoke in favor of giving Foch greater powers as Supreme Commander. Soon after the American 1st Division went into the trenches in the Picardy sector in April, Foch agreed to Pershing's offer to send five additional American divisions into the line organized into its own Army Corps of 150,000 men in total. By the end of April, a second German attack aimed at driving the British to the sea was abandoned after fierce British resistance along the River Lees. On the 2nd of May, Pershing met with Foch, the Prime Ministers of Britain, France and Italy, and British Minister of War, Lord Milner at the Supreme War Council in Abbeville. With the Allies fearing the collapse of the front without American manpower, Pershing stood firm against demands from the other five men to replenish their ranks with American troops. In the end, the American general agreed that the first 120,000 American troops transported across the Atlantic in May would go to the British in return for the resolution that an American army should be formed as early as possible under its own commander and under its own flag. In order to boost Italian morale, Pershing also agreed to send a single regiment to the Italian front. As an increasing number of men in American uniform arrived on French shores, several of Pershing's staff officers were granted permission to take field commands. When Chief of Staff Harbord was given command of a Marine Brigade in May, Pershing appointed as his successor Major General James McAndrew, who had served as the head of the General Staff College at Langa. By the end of May, there were 600,000 American soldiers in France, around half of whom were ready for frontline service. On the 28th of May, American troops participated in their first major battle as Major General Robert Bullard's 1st Division successfully captured the village of Cantigny. The success was overshadowed by a third offensive by 300,000 Germans against the Allied line between Soissons and Reims. Foch had anticipated that this part of the line would remain quiet and manned it with exhausted British and French troops. The Allied line broke, and by the fourth day, the Germans were on the banks of the Marne and closer to Paris than at any time since the beginning of the war. The Allies sent reinforcements to plug the gap, and Pershing dispatched the 2nd and 3rd Divisions to the reserve defending the road to Paris. With the situation increasingly desperate, the British and French in the Supreme War Council now asked Pershing for 250,000 American soldiers a month. 
Blackjack remained insistent that the men should be adequately supplied, and eventually it was agreed that of the 250,000 men, 140,000 would be designated for combat duties, while the rest would be under Pershing's discretion to supply those at the front. By the time the Allies had come to this agreement, the U.S. 3rd Division mounted a valiant defense at Chateau Thierry, while the 2nd Division gradually gained ground as they contested German control of the Belleau Wood, eventually clearing the forest of Germans by the 26th of June. Germany's third offensive had been successfully blunted, and for the first time American soldiers had played a major part in the defense. A fourth German offensive on the Marne salient was defeated following a successful counterattack by General Charles Mangin at the head of four French divisions. Although Paris was now safe, Foch remained anxious and predicted that within a year the political will in Britain and France would be so exhausted that only the Americans could carry on the fight. He knew they would be vulnerable once their offensive energy was exhausted and was keen to go on the offensive quickly. The Supreme Commander was therefore adamant that 100 American divisions be sent to France in order to end the war as soon as possible. Pershing and Foch signed a joint telegram to the War Department in Washington requesting 80 American divisions by April 1919 and the full 100 by July. Foch was ready for the 5th German offensive, launched on the 14th of July between Reims and Chateau Thierry. The 42nd and 3rd U.S. divisions helped to render this final German offensive a complete failure. As he looked at the map on the wall of his office, Pershing saw that Germans had gained significant ground on the Marne salient, which the American commander called a balloon. Even before the 5th German offensive, Foch had developed a plan to prick this German balloon by attacking its exposed flanks. On the 18th of July, the 1st and 2nd American divisions attacked from the Retz Forest and advanced on Soissons, cutting off the main German supply route to the Marne salient and opening the way for the capture of Soissons on the 2nd of August. On the 21st of July, General Ludendorff called off the spring offensive, handing the initiative to Foch and the Allies. The German gamble to defeat the Anglo-French armies before Pershing could mobilize in force had failed. By July, Pershing had more than a million men under his command in France. It was no longer a question of if the Allies would win, but when, and most of the Allied commanders expected that victory in 1919. With the German spring offensive defeated, Pershing could return to his plans for an offensive in Lorraine. He was happy to leave General Hunter Liggett's 1st Corps, which consisted of the 1st and 2nd Divisions, as well as four others in the Marne sector, to join the French in closing the Marne salient. With 10,000 American soldiers arriving in France each day, American supply lines struggled to cope. In late July, Pershing recalled his former Chief of Staff General Harbord, fresh from his success as commander of the 2nd Division in Soissons, to take over the services of supply, and the two men inspected the whole organization together. At its headquarters in Tours, departmental chiefs asked for more horses, trucks, and guns. At Bordeaux, Pershing and Harbord met with black laborers from Mississippi who expressed their desire to go home. In order to motivate them, our board organized them into competitive teams, and the team with the best record would be allowed to go home first. Pershing would also see engineers assembling railroad locomotives and cars, engineering and artillery schools, storage depots, as well as the port of La Rochelle, from where the army received its coal and oil, and that of Brest, where most of the troops were landed. Pershing was not only commander of his army at the front, but the chief of a great enterprise, keeping that army well-fed, well-supplied, and well-treated. By the 6th of August, the Allies had successfully closed the Marne salient following the Second Battle of the Marne, during which the 85,000 Americans of First Corps suffered 12,000 casualties. For his part in developing and coordinating the offensive, General Foch was awarded the coveted Marshal's Baton. A couple of days later, British and Canadian troops attacked the Germans at Amiens and advanced seven miles in a single day. On the 9th, Pershing went to see Marshal Foch 
with a view that it was now time for his independent American army to attack the salient at St. Neil. After receiving the approval of both Foch and Patan, Pershing recalled Liggett's First Corps and transferred it to his newly organized First Army in Lorraine. He then met General Douglas Haig, the British Commander-in-Chief, requesting the return of the American divisions in the British sector, now that the threat of the German offensive had passed. During his time at the British sector, Pershing was also knighted with the Grand Cross of the Order of the Bath by King George V, who had been on a tour inspecting the British troops in France. The town of St. Miel was on the eastern bank of the Mosul River and formed the tip of a German salient, which Pershing had identified as the first stage of his plan to push into Metz and beyond into Germany. The American commander had over 500,000 men of his first army at his disposal, in addition to some 100,000 French troops. Seven American divisions would attack the southern side, while another two would join the French in an attack across the river on the western side. By the end of August, Pershing was ready to launch his offensive, only to receive instructions from Foch to support existing British and French offensives that had proven far more successful than anticipated forcing him to limit the St. Miel offensive. Pershing protested that this would destroy the independent character of the American army, and important time would be lost in moving the divisions in accordance with the new plan, especially as the American supply lines were now directed towards St. Miel. Pershing was nevertheless willing to move his American troops to another sector, provided he retained independent command. After receiving the support of Bataan, Pershing secured Foch's agreement on the original plan to attack St. Miel, while promising that he would have his men ready to support a French offensive against the Meuse River and the Argonne Forest on the 25th of September. On the night of the 11th of September, everything was ready for Pershing's men to attack at 5 o'clock the following morning. The main thrust would come from the south, relieving the pressure for the Franco-American assault on the west three hours later. The Germans had already begun to withdraw when the attack began, and Pershing could see that the troops were achieving their objectives ahead of time as they cut through the German barbed wire with ease. Back at battle headquarters, he called his corps and divisional commanders to speed up their objectives. By the morning of the 13th, the salient was closed when the 1st Division advancing from the southeast joined the 26th Division advancing from the west. The attack continued for another two days, by the end of which the American line extended to Hodemont, 30 kilometers from St. Neil. Pershing's men had taken 16,000 prisoners and 450 enemy guns, recovering 200 square miles of territory. It was a spectacular triumph for the American Army's first offensive, which cost around 7,000 in killed and wounded. Pershing had initially anticipated attacking the fortress of Metz after taking St. Miel, but he had agreed with Foch and Patan to turn his attention towards the Meurs Argon line, even though a frontal assault would be more costly than Pershing's proposed flank attack. In preparation for this new offensive, Pershing moved his headquarters to Sealy, where a couple of years earlier, Patan and Nivelle had commanded the French army during the defense of Verdun. Pershing's first army was to be deployed in line from the Argonne Forest in the west to the heights of Verdun in the east. The German position in this sector was protected by deep fields of barbed wire in front of the first line, and they had prepared three more positions to withdraw to in the event of an attack. The Meurs Argonne offensive would combine with the Anglo French drive towards Saint Quentin and Cambrai, which would see the Allies attacking along the whole length of the line. If Pershing and his men were successful, the Americans would threaten to cut off the Saddam Izzir's railroad, which served as the main line of communications for the German army in western France. Within 11 days of the St. Miel offensive, Pershing's first army of 600,000 men now had to be redeployed to take this new line. The movements were coordinated by Colonel George C. Marshall, Jr., the first army's assistant chief of staff. Pershing himself went back and forth to corps and divisional headquarters to ensure that all was in order. By the night of the 24th of September, all nine divisions of the 1st Army were in place. 
Following a three-hour artillery barrage, the attack began at 5.30 on the morning of the 26th of September. In the center, the 79th Division, which did not even have any trench experience, managed to capture the town of Montfaucon by the end of the second day. On the left, the poorly led 35th Division of National Guardsmen from Kansas and Missouri was badly mauled by the German defenders and lost half their men. The American line advanced up to five miles, though sustained German counterattacks forced some of the advanced units back to straighten the line, while Pershing arranged for a rotation of the divisions engaged in battle. The Allies were also making progress along other sectors of the line. With the German effort flagging, the German Chancellor resigned and was replaced by Prince Maximilian von Baden, who made an overture of peace to the Allies based on the 14 points that President Wilson had set out in January 1918. With the prospect of peace at hand, the French sought to restrict further American involvement in the war in order to limit American influence at the peace talks while British Prime Minister David Lloyd George was keen to have American support of Britain's war aims. Pershing knew nothing of the talk of peace and continued to focus on fighting the battle, spending the majority of his time on his train, going back and forth visiting divisional and brigade headquarters to inspire and motivate his subordinates. He withdrew the 91st, 35th, 37th, and 79th Divisions and replaced them with the 1st, 3rd and 32nd Divisions in reserve. On the 4th of October, the second attack was launched against the forbidding terrain of the Air River and the Argonne Forest. The 1st Division managed to establish control of the heights over the east bank of the Air. The advance of the 28th and 82nd Divisions relieved pressure on the 77th Division, which managed to press forward and regain contact with Major Charles Whittlesey's Lost Battalion that had been isolated within enemy lines for six days. In the center, the 4th, 80th, and 32nd Divisions found progress more difficult as they sought to capture the formidable Romaine Heights on the Hindenburg Line. On the right, the 33rd Division built bridges across the Meurs and managed to capture several German batteries, while the 29th Division followed up with successive attacks. After another brief respite, on the 14th of October, Pershing launched a series of assaults which captured the Romaine Heights. Pershing singled out the 33rd Division for capturing the strongest enemy positions on the Côtes dame marie while the 42nd Division's 84th Brigade, under the command of Brigadier General Douglas MacArthur, seized the heights of the Côtes de Châtillon and took the machine gun positions in fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat. By the 17th, the Americans were in control of the heights and for the next couple of weeks, they had to defend against German counterattacks to regain the heights. But by the end of the month, the Americans had cleared the Argonne Forest of Germans. In the meantime, Pershing turned his attention back to Metz and organized a second army under the command of Major General Robert Bullard. Pershing then handed command of the First Army to General Liggett and remained in supreme command of both armies. Despite the American successes over unfavorable terrain during the Mers Argonne Offensive, Pershing's progress was not as significant as the Allied offenses further to the west. French Prime Minister Georges Clemenceau was impatient at Pershing's slow progress, and on the 21st of October wrote a letter to Marshal Foch asking for Pershing to be removed as Commander in Chief of the American Army claiming that Pershing was deliberately preserving his men in order to sacrifice more French lives. Foch refused the demand, and the French premier could do no more. Meanwhile, on the political front, President Wilson had signaled his willingness to negotiate on the basis of the 14 points without consultation with Pershing. On the 25th of October, Pershing met with Foch, Patan, and Haig to discuss armistice terms. Both Pershing and General Tasker Bliss, who had remained on the Supreme War Council after his retirement as Chief of Staff of the United States Army, had been in favor of unconditional surrender. On the question of an armistice, Pershing agreed with Patan that the Germans should agree to Allied occupation of the east bank of the Rhine and Alsace-Lorraine, and in addition called for Germany to surrender its submarines to ensure the American Army could return home safely. 
After Pershing transmitted these proposed terms to President Wilson, the President replied on the 30th that it would be enough to intern German submarines in neutral ports and opposed American occupation of Alsace-Lorraine or the eastern bank of the Rhine. Wilson additionally asked Pershing to consult with his advisor, Edward House, who was now in Paris. Later on the 30th, Pershing wrote a letter to House in which he argued that giving the Germans an armistice might allow the Germans to fight another day. He concluded with his opinion that Germany should be forced into an unconditional surrender, but that any armistice should be sufficiently restrictive as to not allow the Germans to take up arms again. Pershing and his French allies had agreed to launch a general attack on the 1st of November. The fourth and final German line of the defenses on the Barracourt Heights remained a formidable obstacle, but after that it was an easy march down the heights to capture the railroad. The 89th and 2nd Divisions of 5th Corps in the center aimed to turn the west flank of the heights, with two more divisions in reserve, while the 5th and 90th Divisions of 3rd Corps would attack the east flank. The 80th, 77th and 78th of 1st Corps protected the left flank of 5th Corps. With air and artillery support, the attack began at daybreak on the 1st of November, and by nightfall, the men had reached their objectives all along the line. On the back of the successes of the 1st Army, Pershing was given permission by Foch to advance the 2nd Army towards Metz. By the 9th of November, the 1st Army had scaled the heights and was racing down them in pursuit of the retreating Germans. An order went out in Pershing's name, ordering the 1st Army to take the honor of capturing Sedan, the site of the French decisive defeat in 1870 during the Franco-Prussian War. In the ensuing confusion, the U.S. 1st Division cut across MacArthur's 42nd Division in the race to Sedan, offending the sensibilities of the French. General Liggett agreed to withdraw and give the French 4th Army the opportunity to recapture the town. With the capture of Sedan, the plan Pershing had conceived in 1917 had been fulfilled. Although an armistice was scheduled for 11 o'clock on the 11th of November, Pershing followed Foch's instructions and continued fighting until the clock struck 11, resulting in 3,500 American casualties on the morning of the final day of battle. Over a million Americans fought in the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, of whom more than 120,000 were casualties. The German army, which had fewer than a half a million men in the sector, suffered a similar number of casualties. In December 1918, President Woodrow Wilson arrived in France to participate in the Paris Peace Conference. On the day of his arrival in Paris, Pershing remarked, He has been a good president to us, backed the army well, but he has his hands full now. Pershing knew that the task of making peace with the British, French and Italians would be no easy task and was happy to leave it to the president. Although the war was won, Pershing still remained in command of more than two million men. Of these, 240,000 men of General Joseph Dickman's Third Army served in the Allied occupation force on the eastern bank of the Rhine. The rest of the men would have to be transported back to the United States and demobilized, while their spare supplies could go towards reconstructing Europe after the wartime devastation. On the 14th of July, 1919, Pershing rode at the head of an American regiment in the Victory Parade under the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. In September 1919, Congress recognized Pershing's service by promoting him to the rank of General of the Armies, specially created in his honor. He would become the highest-ranking general in American history until 1976, when President Gerald Ford posthumously elevated George Washington to the same rank while ensuring that Washington would forever remain the highest-ranking officer in the U.S. military. In 2022, in honor of the 200th anniversary of his birth, General Ulysses Grant joined Washington and Pershing in that exalted rank. Following his return to Washington, Pershing was promised the salary of a four-star general for the rest of his life. Given the prestige and popularity he had gained as the victorious commander in the First World War, a group of admirers drafted him as a presidential candidate in 1920, though Pershing refused to campaign. 
His rival, General Leonard Wood, was an early frontrunner for the Republican presidential nomination, but Warren Harding eventually prevailed. In 1921, Pershing was appointed Chief of Staff of the United States Army, serving for three years until his mandatory retirement from active service at the age of 64. In 1919, the U.S. Army sent a convoy of the Motor Transport Corps across the United States from Washington, D.C. to San Francisco to determine whether the country's road system was fit for purpose in case of a national emergency. By taking two months to make the journey, the convoy highlighted the poor state of repair of the road network. Accordingly, the Bureau of Public Roads requested from the U.S. Army a list of the most important roads in the United States in case of war. Drawing on his experience as commander of the AEF, when he had set up the supply lines for his army, Pershing coordinated the Army's efforts to create a map of the country's road network, highlighting the priority routes. After Pershing presented this map to Congress in 1922, it came to be known as the Pershing Map. The map led to major road-building projects in the 1920s, but work slowed down significantly following the Wall Street Crash of 1929. It wasn't until the mid-1950s that President Eisenhower established the interstate highway system based largely on Pershing's recommendations. Pershing took great interest in the commemoration of the men under his command who fell in the First World War. In November 1921, Pershing was in Kansas City for the groundbreaking dedication of the Liberty Memorial, where he once again met with Marshal Foch and other senior Allied war leaders. In the years following the war, Many American units waiting to demobilize built their own monuments dotted around the European countryside in a haphazard, uncoordinated fashion. In March 1923, Congress established the American Battle Monuments Commission under Pershing's leadership to determine the design and location of official battle monuments. In addition to coordinating the construction of 13 battle monuments, the Commission also organized efforts to gather the bodies of the fallen in eight cemeteries on the sites of the main battlefields. Pershing would travel to France every summer to oversee construction work, and though Foch had died in 1929, Patin still lived to welcome his old friend back to France. In 1937, all the World War I cemeteries and monuments were dedicated, including those at Belleau Wood, Chateau Thierry, Saint Miel, and on the Romain Heights at Mers Argonne. In 1931, Pershing published his memoirs in two volumes under the title My Experiences in the World War, which won the 1932 Pulitzer Prize. By the late 1930s, Pershing's health was in decline as he approached his 80th birthday, and he spent more of his time at the Walter Reed Military Hospital. After the outbreak of the Second World War in 1939, Pershing privately regretted that the Germans had not been forced to surrender unconditionally 20 years earlier. He was sure that the British and French would hold back the Germans as they had done in the First World War, and was shocked to hear of French resistance crumbling in the face of the German onslaught over six weeks from May to June 1940. He sympathized with his friend Marshal Patton, who at the age of 84 was appointed Prime Minister in order to sign a capitulation that retained as much French honor as possible. For the next four years, Patton would serve as the Nazi German puppet of the Vichy regime. Following the fall of France, Pershing called for the United States to provide more military aid to the United Kingdom and publicly supported the Destroyers for Bases Agreement, whereby the Americans would supply the British with old destroyers in return for long-term leases on British, naval, and air bases. After the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December, 1941, and the American entry into the Second World War, Pershing took an even greater interest in the course of the war. Pershing's mind turned back not only to his experiences in France, but those in Japan, Manchuria, and the Philippines. Pershing was pleased to learn that his son Francis Warren Pershing enlisted in the army as a private, who took part in the Normandy landings and fought all the way to the River Elder 
ending the war as a major. Although Commander-in-Chief Dwight E. Eisenhower had never served under Pershing, most of the U.S. Army's senior generals had done so during World War I. General George Marshall was now Chief of Staff of the U.S. Army, coordinating the war effort from his desk in Washington. General Douglas MacArthur defeated the Japanese in the Philippines, while Pershing's former staff officer George Patton proved one of the most dynamic Army commanders of the war. In December 1944, Congress instituted the five-star rank of General of the Army for the likes of Eisenhower, Marshall, and MacArthur, but Pershing continued to outrank them as General of the Armies. Pershing hoped to travel to Europe to salute the victorious American soldiers following the Nazi surrender on the 8th of May, 1945, but he suffered a stroke, which paralyzed the side of his body. In 1946, the 85-year-old Pershing married the 51-year-old French-Romanian artist Micheline Resco, with whom he had an affair in Paris in 1917, at a secret ceremony in his apartment at the Walter Reed Hospital. On the 15th of July, 1948, General of the Army's John Joseph Pershing died at the age of 87. He was given a state funeral organized by General George Marshall and buried among World War I veterans at Arlington National Cemetery at a site known as Pershing Hill. From his earliest days as a schoolteacher, John J. Pershing exhibited leadership abilities that would make him an effective military officer. Although he had never envisaged a military career and the prospects of promotion seemed bleak, Pershing remained in uniform and continued to catch the attention of civil and military officials in the War Department. After service in the Spanish-American War and taking part in the suppression of the Moro insurgency in the Philippines, Pershing was given the opportunity to learn as much as possible from the Japanese in the art of modern warfare, after which he was rewarded with a brigadier generalship by President Roosevelt. After spending another six years or so in the Philippines, General Pershing moved to the Mexican border. After a tragedy that claimed the lives of his wife and daughters, Pershing led 10,000 men in the Pancho Villa expedition, carefully balancing the political and military demands of the assignment. As commander of the American Expeditionary Force, Pershing was responsible for training and supplying an army which expanded from tens of thousands of men to three million. Although he was criticized by his allies for his insistence on ensuring that the men were as well-trained and well-supplied as possible, and on the maintenance of the independent character of the American Army, he was pragmatic enough to place American divisions under French and British commanders to defend against the spring offensive. In the final months of the war, American successes at St. Mihiel and the Meurs Argonne justified Pershing's approach in creating an independent American army in France. Pershing's extraordinary achievements received due recognition when Congress promoted him to General of the Armies. After playing a key role in the planning of the U.S. highway system and the construction of World War I memorials, Pershing lived long enough to follow the full course of the Second World War, fought by a generation of generals who served under his command. What do you think of John J. Pershing? Does he deserve his place alongside Washington and Grant as one of only three men to have been honored with the rank of General of the Armies? Or was he to blame for wasting American lives by launching a frontal attack at the Meurs Argonne and continuing to fight until the hour of the armistice? Please let us know in the comments section. And in the meantime, thank you very much for watching.